good evening. And I know it's good morning uh, to you, Neil, because it's early morning in New York where you are now. My name is Sevgil Mosaeva. I'm chief editor of Ukrainska Pravda and Ukrainian journalist from Crimea. And today I think that we will have an absolutely fantastic discussion because, because we have two brilliant authors. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure. And I think uh, everyone in Ukraine waits this discussion and waits uh, those also. Uh, I want to... I want to introduce uh, Yuval Noah Harari, a um, great historian and a best-selling author of a number of books, and Neil Gaiman, who represents himself as uh, author, screenwriter, and storyteller. I know that. Uh, so we, of course, uh, we will speak about um, your work. We'll speak about future. Because, because we have this connection. And, uh, of course, we will speak about... Um, Unfortunately, um, situation now in Ukraine and war in Ukraine, because it uh, full um, scale war in Ukraine has been going already in six months. And um, in the every day it takes the lives of people. Um, it destroys destinies of the people. It destroys also, it's still future. And, uh, and what I want to start with, I want to start about the future and um, what brings you together is an attempt to explain and imagine the future. And it's about artificial intelligence, it's about technology. And up till now, um, we have reflected a lot on these prospects and um, it caused fear as well, of course, of course. Uh, but uh, we have now feeling that it was decided to return us to the past um, and where we have space, uh, for censorship, for tyranny, and unfortunately, war. Uh, what do you think about this encounter uh, with the past? And how far the current situation moving us away from the future uh, you've described already? Maybe we'll start with uh, you, Neval. You are... Well, uh, you know, the past has a hold on us. I often think that we are living inside the dreams of dead people. You know, all these kings and, and leaders and sometimes poets from hundreds of years ago, sometimes thousands of years ago, that send their icy hands from the graves and still control our minds, still control our, our, our thoughts and our behavior. And as a historian, I think that the main point of studying history is not to remember the past, but to be liberated from it. And um, I, when, when I look at what's happening in Ukraine, I see really millions of people who are really struggling and uh, are very, very bravely to liberate themselves from the past. And, from, and on the other side, somebody who is trying to kind of drag them back into the past. You know, Putin is, is, is fighting this war in, in, in the name of all kinds of historical fantasies in his mind. But above all, he really cannot let go of the past. And I think the, the one thing he fears most about the Ukrainians is um, that they have a future, that they want a future. They don't want to go back to the past. And maybe say just one more thing. You know, a lot of people have been asking me also what I think about the future of Russia. And will Russia ever be able to be, say, a democracy? And people say, no, it's impossible because of their history, because of their culture or whatever. And I think that Ukraine is the best answer to that. Because, you know, the Ukrainians and the Russians have been living under the same dictatorial and tyrannical regimes for a very long time, first under the Tsarist dictatorship, then under the communist totalitarian regime. And the Ukrainians made a choice in 1991 and again and again after that, that they want a different future. And I think that this is the thing that most frightens Putin and the people around him. That if the Ukrainians succeed in building a better future for themselves, then the Russians would want the same thing. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Neil. And what, what is your opinion? Um, do you think that it's also like a battle between future and past, how you all told about it? There, there's an old English saying that those who cannot learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And uh, you definitely get the feeling right now that uh, whereas, you know, a mere 25 years ago, people were talking about the end of history. They were acting as if, you know, everything that had happened would happen. We had all learned our lessons. Everybody was getting along. The Iron Curtain had fallen and uh, everybody was just going to be friends and we were going to be heading off to a magical Star Trek future in which all kinds of people were on the bridge of the Enterprise. And uh, here we are now in 2022, and we're definitely making a mess of things. Everywhere we look, we're making a mess of things. Um, but people are still good. And people are sometimes they're misguided, occasionally they're evil, sometimes they're scared. Um, Sometimes they're trapped. But I do feel like we haven't quite burned up our options yet. Um, and, uh, you know, I think what's happening in Ukraine actually gives hope. Um, you know, when, when this happened, this kind of thing happened before and the tanks rolled in from Russia, that was it. Countries rolled over. They were taken over. They were assimilated. Um, this is this is something different. This is a stage of history that we haven't seen before. This is a resistance and a resistance that's working. Um, now, I, you know, I hope it can be an inspiration on all of the other places that we need to learn from. Things like climate change. Things like battling international fascism, extremism, things like the, the mess that the, the long tail and the global village have led us into, um, where all of a sudden extremists all over the place can talk to each other and suddenly become a critical mass of extremists rather than that one idiot in the village who was well outnumbered by the nice people and the sensible people and the sane people. Um, so I, I think, you know, we have a way to go. But I think that I don't feel like we've lost all hopes of the future yet. I think we're still progressing towards a future. And, you know, the biggest question I suspect is whether our grandchildren or our great grandchildren have a habitable planet and whether our great grandchildren have food sources and water sources. Uh, Cause if they don't, if this is, if rising sea levels and extreme climate messes things up, then there's going to be more wars. There's going to be more struggles for ever decreasing supplies. Hmm. If, if I may add something connecting to something you said, Neil, I mean, this whole idea of the end of history and its, 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 its collapse, you know, as a historian, what I find really, really kind of like personally uh, terrible is this kind of the need to relearn the lessons again and again. It's like, you know, you went to school, you had a lesson, you passed the exam, you come back the next day, it's the same lesson. Haven't you learned anything? And no, we haven't. I mean, we, ha we learned something, but apparently not enough. And sometimes I feel, you know, in the name of my profession, the kind of, of professional failure of, of the discipline of, of history, that we are apparently, we are, either we are not telling the story well enough, uh, if people have to kind of relearn the, what, again fascism, again war, haven't we been through this enough times? Or I mean, like kind of the more uh, uh, um, uh, the, the other option is that um, it's not really in our hands 
as historians uh, that, you know, history is just too important to be left to the historians. So you have all these politic politicians who are commandeering history and kind of twisting it to their own purposes. But still, as a historian, it's, it's really, really kind of so depressing that we have to go through this again. Uh, I want to add something and I want to continue this pass. Um, why do you think humanity needs all these uh, trials? I mean, not only our war, but um, Neil mentioned climate change. We also can you now uh, start to speak about pandemics. Uh, we already leave two, hour, uh, two years. Uh, so, and um, I want to mention you, Neil, because you told before uh, that it's only like a big universe and it's, it's very dark, but at the same time, you, you're thinking about hope. Where is hope here? Because we face with a lot of, a lot of terrible changes. We don't learn lessons. You said it. Uh, so what, 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 what is the purpose of all these events? First of all, the, the, purpose of anything and the anything the purpose of anything with people in it is beyond me um i think you can point to the purpose of an individual you can just about point to the purpose of a group but when you start talking about countries and politicians and huge populations they want to survive they want to get through their day most of them you know they would like a roof over their head and food and for their children to be safe. And, and after that, it gets a bit mad. Um, but I think that hope, we, we have hope. We have hope because the same tools that we are using to mess the world up are the same tools that we use to fix things. And they are our brains. They are our minds. Um, human beings are a, a, we are fascinating. As a, as, a, as, a, as a species, we're fascinating. One reason why we're fascinating is because we have books, because we have ways of keeping the knowledge of human beings in the past, of keeping their discoveries, of maintaining them and building upon them, um, we wound up in a place where we can do miracles. You know, there, there's, if you want to read the fairy tales of 500 years ago, there's nothing that a fabulous magician could do in one of those fairy tales that we can't do now. We can get on our magic carpets and uh, they may be planes and you may be sitting there having to eat bad peanuts and squashed in next to somebody who didn't wash, but you're still um, magically being transported across oceans in, in tiny amounts of time. The fact that we are talking to each other right now is amazing. It is miraculous. And we must not, we must not lose sight of that. We mustn't lose sight. Yes, climate change is terrible. Yes, um, if we don't do something, we may be dooming the planet or dooming a significant part of its population. Will we do something? I don't know. Can we do something? Do we actually have the ability? Do we have the knowledge? Well, yeah, we do. We have lots of very sensible people out there who've been saying for 30, 40 years, okay, this is what we need to do in order to stop this stuff. I think that both of us, Neil and Mimi, are fascinated by, by mythology and by the ability of humans to create completely new realities out of their imagination. Um, but perhaps I'm more... Um, skeptical or, or, or pessimistic ab about this ability, uh, especially when people become very powerful and they can realize these myths, these fantasies in their hands, this can become extremely dangerous. 
You know, it, it starts with, with again, let, let's go back to the war. I mean, one way to understand this war is that where did it begin? It began in the fantasies of, of Putin as a child. Uh, you know, hearing all these stories about the Second World War and dreaming about one day also being this great hero who fights the Nazis and eventually reaching the point that he is kind of casting this fantasy on the world, not realizing that he is also casting himself into the role of the Nazis, but in his imagination, you know, going back to being, I don't know, a, a kid hearing these stories about the siege of Leningrad, in his imagination, he's recreating these, these fantasies. And going from that all the way to, the, uh, 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 to new technologies that we are developing that are enabling us to try and realize our, our mythologies. You know, I look at now all the fascination that uh, many people in Silicon Valley and elsewhere have with the metaverse and have with, uh, you know, transporting ourselves into a virtual reality world. And for me as a historian and as a student of, of mythology, you know, this goes back to th thousands of years to the arguments of the early Christians about their theology and their mythology. Because you had one camp that believed that humans are bodies, uh, and even, you know, even Jesus himself, when he talks about the resurrection, he has in mind a resurrection in the flesh of the body. And we, when he talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, he means a real kingdom on earth with, you know, stones and trees and all that. But there was another camp which talked about um, that the body is not important. There is just an eternal immaterial soul. This is who we really are. And hopefully we'll one day be released from this material, dirty, smelly, physical body and exist in heaven, in an immaterial realm. And now we are at a point of history, you know, thousands of years later, when this argument actually becomes a reality. It's not only a fantasy in the mind. When you watch somebody sitting in a room with maybe, maybe some goggles or maybe just with a screen all day, is he trapped inside this small room? Or is he or she, you know, liberated? into the immaterial realm of, of cyberspace, of the metaverse. And this theological battle from 2000 years ago is now becoming um, a real battle about how human life would look like in coming generations and what is the, the role of, of our bodies. I mean, are they important in any way? Or is the, is the point to kind of release our mind or our soul from this to exist in an immaterial realm. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting point, and uh, I think that we also can start to, to speak here about propaganda. And you mentioned in the beginning of your uh, speech about, um, about imagination of Putin. And I think it uh, totally exists from propaganda sources. And propaganda is one of the elements of core elements of this war. And I think, um, uh, and disinformation became um, a, a challenge to the humanity. And uh, um, all this including can be about the human fantasy. And you mentioned like a little bit about that. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, um, you told about Putin and he created his own imagination about Nazis in his, in his brain. At the same time, we see here Neil, who created like beautiful words, who created future, who created how, and how it's possible and how it's possible like that one imagination can destroy such countries as Ukraine. And another one, imagination can build such beautiful words, uh, how Neil does. Or <laughs> I think that that it's the glory and the tragedy of human beings is that we have imaginations and that we can follow 
our dreams, but also other people's dreams. And, you know, there is the, the terrible side to that. There is the ability of people to just go, okay, right. Everybody with blue eyes is a bad person. And suddenly all of the people with blue eyes are being rounded up and put into camps. Um, and on the other hand, there is, you know, there are the things that we get right. I feel like, you know, democracy is an incredibly fragile idea. It's manipulable. It, um, it, it, when it goes wrong, um, it tends to go wrong because, you know, democracy works if you have an informed electorate, but who is doing the informing? How are they informed? Are they being lied to? Can you police this? All of that kind of thing is happening, but you can still inspire people. You can still get the idea across to people that they can be better, that they can do better, and you can give them stories that they then can take and improve with. I, I, I never understand when people start talking about some stories being bad because they're escapism. And for me, I, I'm with, with C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, when they said the only people who really hate escape are jailers. You, you need to be able to escape sometimes. If you're in an intolerable situation here, I will give you a book, I will give you a story that may let you out and away just for a little while. My, my, my cousin Helen died very recently at the age of 104. And uh, she would have been a 22 year old in the Radomsk ghetto in Poland. Um, during the war, the Nazis had imprisoned them all in the ghetto. They had told them that there were to be no books. If you were caught with a book, it would mean a bullet in the head. Terrible things were happening. You know, you'd get people being, anyway, uh, awful things were happening. But Helen, who was doing a sewing group, she was meant to be teaching sewing and dressmaking to the little girls uh, younger than her in the ghetto, but she was actually teaching them mathematics and languages, and she was determined to teach them what she could. She got hold of a copy of Gone with the Wind in Polish translation, and she would stay up late every night reading a chapter or two chapters with her windows uh, blacked out so that she could read the story. She would hide the book behind a loose brick in the wall and replace the brick. And then when the girls came in, she would tell them the story of what she had read in the previous chapter the night before. And just for an hour every day, those girls in the ghettos the, whose, whose parents had already been taken off many of them and sent to the gas chambers, um, they got to escape. And that facility of the, of the brain, the fact that you can engage the imagination, for me is a gift that we have. It's something incredibly special. It sets us apart. And it's a responsibility. So, so as a story, as the maker of stories, as a maker of fiction, I feel like my job is always going to be to try and inspire, to try and give better ways and to try and teach, even if what I'm doing is just giving you a place to go and dream. Um, what will be your response as the historian, hmm. Paul? Well, about the propaganda, I think that the world, certainly the West, has so much now to learn from Ukraine on, on many levels, but also with that, because Ukraine has been subject to a very intense propaganda and disinformation campaign in recent years from, from Russia, more than probably any other country. And when Putin invaded, he expected his propaganda campaign to be so successful that nobody would resist him. 
And I think even many people in the West, even people in Ukraine, maybe didn't know, thought that perhaps part of the population would welcome him. And it failed completely. It completely failed. And when you see the, the problems we have in other countries, like, like the USA, with this information campaign, I think we should come and take lessons from, from the Ukrainians. What did you do that was so successful that the Russian disinformation and propaganda campaign completely, at least from the outside, it looks like it completely failed. And I think also, you know, with regard to stories and their, their power to do good, to do bad, many of the kind of crucial ideas of humanity, they always have two sides. It depends how you tell the story. If you think, for instance, about the story of the nation and nationalism and patriotism, so, you know, one way to tell it is that uh, patriotism is about hating foreigners and hating minorities and, and uh, you know, glorious fights and wars. And this is the kind of story that Putin tells. And then you have the other story that uh, patriotism is not about hating anybody. It's not a story of hate. It's a story of love. It's a story of how you love a particular group of people in a special way. You care about them. And therefore, for instance, in times of war, you're willing even to risk your life for them, which is the story that now Ukraine is, is, is telling the world. But there is no need of war. There is no necessary connection between patriotism and war. Uh, patriotism, ideally, is, again, an ideal of peace. That patriotism is, is paying your taxes honestly, so that other people on the other side of the country would get good education and good health care and a sewage system. I think a well-functioning sewage system is a much uh, better symbol for, for patriotism than, you know, these glorious stories and flag-waving and, 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 and things like that. And um, finally, I, I think that there are special moments in history when you see this battle very, very clearly. And these are the moments that afterwards uh, people tell stories about for generations and generations. And, you know, when, when I look to the future, I'm convinced that Ukrainians will be telling stories about what has been happening in, in, in these few months for many, many generations to come. Like, the, if you want to get into the story, this is the moment. Like, this is the moment that will be told about, and, you know, people like Neil and people like me would, would be writing history books and would be writing uh, uh, novels and, 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 and fictional stories and, and TV shows and whatever will be in, in, the, in the future again and again about what happened in these months. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, um, actually, I want to think a little bit about imagination and uh, just maybe about like uh, future that um, maybe uh, you, 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 you will um, imagine you as a historian from the future. And uh, what will you tell um, the future generation about this war, about what 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 what, how, what happened in Ukraine in 2022? And you, Neil, uh, will sing from 2022 and will try to uh, and, um, kind of say a lot of things what, how, how um, events now in Ukraine and not only in Ukraine will affect the future of um, uh, humanity. And I, I mean, we don't know, um, but what we hope and that's the best you can go go for it is you know as a as a writer of fiction you sit there and you go well if only and if this goes on and what if and part of my huge if only right now is um you know if this goes on ukraine will defeat russia uh the russians will have to reconsider um they will have to reconsider Putin for a start, uh, but also reconsider, reconsider the system they've got of 
oligarchies, of extortion, of, you know, you've got a, a country that should be a very rich country that keeps being bled dry by people who come in and move the wealth out of the country and then the country itself fails. Um, I, I love the idea that a functioning sewage system is actually tells you more about the state of civilization of a country than whether it has tanks and flags waving. Um, I, I was reminded of Margaret Mead, the anthropologist's comment, that the point that you know that civilization is happening is the point where you find skeletons with healed broken legs. Because if you have a skeleton and a healed broken leg, it means other people looked after them. Other people went and got them food. Other people cared for each other. Because if you are out in the wilderness and you're on your own and your leg is broken, you're dead. Um, you know, the only way that you get that bone gets to healed is if other people care for you. And I think, so for me, everything um, in terms of how people view what's happening now is if Ukraine goes under, then one more light that should be a light of hope goes out. There is less hope in the world. Um, there is less joy in the world and our protections against totalitarianism um, are, are lessened. And just as they were lessened by Trump, by the events of January the 6th, just as they were lessened by, you know, some of the, the, the bizarre things that have been happening in the UK over the last six or seven years, where things that make no sense happen, continue to happen, and the country looks around astonished. Um, but for me, you know, one of the great things about Ukraine right now is it didn't go under. The lights didn't, haven't gone out yet, and I hope they never do. I hope those candles keep burning and inspire other candles to burn and other lights to stay on around the world. Well, for me also, I mean, it's impossible to know how future historians will tell the, the, the story because it's not, it's not over yet. And you always have to, to wait to see what will happen next. Um, I do hope that they will tell the story of, of this war as, as a turning point, uh, not just for, for, for Ukraine, but for the world as a whole, as a turning point, hopefully for the West, um, that... Um, again, the, the biggest problem that the West now has is its own internal culture war. That is tearing itself apart over things that, I mean, I don't understand. The actual ideological gap is much smaller than in most previous eras, yet the level of, of animosity and hatred and really inability to, to have a conversation, it's really astounding. Um, and I hope that the war would serve, I mean, it's not happening so far, but we can hope that it would serve as a wake-up call to end the culture war within the West. Uh, because the West is still the most powerful bloc in the world. You know, you think about Russia. Um, the Russian economy is smaller than the Italian economy. In economic terms, it's about the Netherlands and Belgium put together. If, if, if the world, if, if, if the Western bloc, uh, uh, Europe, the United States, and certainly if it uh, keeps its ties with other democracies around the world, um, if, if it doesn't disintegrate, it doesn't need to fear anybody in the world. So I hope we'll see this end of this internal culture war. I also hope that it will be a turning point for Russia that, uh, uh, again, that Russia will, re will realize, as, as Neil said, it's a very rich country in resources. It's also a very rich country in human resources, very well educated, uh, yet most people are so poor in terms of the services they get, uh, healthcare, welfare, and, and so forth. And uh, I hope they can, they can turn this around. 
And for that also I hope that this war doesn't sow the seeds of future hatred. That you know, often in history one war sows the seeds for another. I hope it doesn't happen this time. That, uh, that at least on, on, on our side we keep the door open. I mean, you can have very little hope for this regime. But for the Russian people, I hope that uh, we can be again uh, part of, 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 of the same group, of the same family of people, that this is not a war against them. And also, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm disturbed when I hear people saying that we need now to boycott Russian culture, for instance, not to read Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, not to hear Tchaikovsky. This is terrible. This is, you know, first of all, it, it gives kind of Putin ownership of Tolstoy, as if this is his book, or this is his author. And, and secondly, the, it, it is sowing seeds of future hatred and, and, and future conflict. So, again, we can't do this for the Russians, they have to do it for themselves, to choose differently, to change their future, but we must always keep the door open for that. Okay, actually, it was my next question, and I want to continue our uh, discussion and conversation with a question about books and Russian literature, uh, because actually we have a big discussion now in Ukrainian society, and part of society think that it's also um, like a part of colonial culture and colonial influence of Russia, because you don't have, for example, monuments of uh, uh, Byron, uh, uh, each city in Ukraine, but you have Pushkin monuments in each city in Ukraine. And it means like it's uh, not about culture, it's more about influence, it's, it's about colonial policy. So, and I know uh, actually you, all, you mentioned in uh, interview with Mikhail Ziger that uh, it was last your book that you read um, in Russian literature and you, Neil, visited Russia a lot of times and you, I know you um, um, not love maybe, but respect uh, to Bulgakov, who is actually um, Kiev uh, uh, burst also, but at the same time, Russia wants to <laughs> privatize him as well. And we have a big discussion about him as well. So my question, what to do when books bring pain to an entire nation? Because it's, it's about Ukrainian now. They feel pain when they, you know, I know my mom, she left Crimea, occupied Crimea. I'm originally from Crimea. And when she left, she, uh, when she, she moved to Kiev, she left all her Russian literature books, unfortunately, in her place because it was about pain. I think that that has to be uh, something that's up to the individual. Um, and I think, you know, what you were talking about, Bulgakov, where it's like, well, who wants to claim a writer? Um, who gets to claim a writer? Who gets to, uh, you know, I don't, I think there are very few writers of fiction who are writing as representatives of a country. We write as human beings. We write as part of the human race. And if we make things that last, and if we make things that matter, whether it's music or, or, or whether it's um, literature or whether it's great paintings, um, I think there's a level on which we have to always be seen as doing that as part of the human race and adding to the culture. Having said that, you know, there are places where I wind up having huge discussions with myself about what do I believe, where do I go with an author? I have friends who are Jewish who cannot listen to Wagner, um, who just go, no, he was just too, he, he, he's too far over. I look at someone like Ezra Pound, uh, who on the one hand was an astonishing modernist poet, was huge and important, and on the other hand, really was a Nazi, an anti-Semite, appalling, not a good person. Um, and I go, where do I stand on Ezra Pound? I can, I absolutely appreciate the beauty of the poetry. I absolutely appreciate his part in where, what happened to poetry over the last um, 
150 years, where it began, where it is now. And Pound plays a huge part in that. And I can also go, and he was awful. Um, and I think that all of that, I, you know, I, I don't think we get any free passes. By the same token, I think that if you want to go, I will not read this author because they are German, because they are Russian, because they are Irish, because they are American, because they are Korean, you are limiting, you know, you're cutting yourself off from part of humanity because artists who create great work, I think we have to go, they are doing it as human, as a representative of the human race, rather than as a representative of a political party that exists right now. Thank you, Neil. And yeah, so I think yeah, it, it, it's complicated. I mean, on the one hand, it's very clear that very often imperial and colonial projects, um, they make use of art. They make use of artists. You know, you put a statue of, of this author in every city, you force all the students to read their works, and, and this should be resisted, of course. But um, on the other hand, we shouldn't kind of let them own, just because they say that we now own it, we shouldn't kind of cooperate with it. You know, there was this famous incident, I don't, I don't re remember who it was, but somebody who wanted to disparage African culture and asked rhetorically, who is the Tolstoy of the Africans? Uh, to, meaning that no African author is, is, is coming even close to, to, to the kind of work that Tolstoy created. And I think it was Ralph, Ralph Wiley, an African-American journalist, who replied in, in a beautiful way. He didn't kind of, you know, fell, fall into the trap of, okay, let me list you a list of great African writers and let, let's have a fight, who, who is bigger? No, his answer was, Tolstoy is the Tolstoy of the Africans. He doesn't belong to, to the Russians. He doesn't belong to the West. He belongs to, to, to all humans. What he writes about, um, the, the, the human emotions, the conflicts, it's relevant to everybody. I mean, he himself was influenced by so many people from other nations, from other cultures. And, you know, going back 2000 years, you have the, I think it was the playwright Terence, who said that I'm human, and nothing human is foreign to me. But as a human being, all human creation, I'm the, it, it's my legacy. In the same way that as, as humans, we, we inherit even much more than just all human creation. We inherit evolution. We inherit our, our emotions, love and fear and so forth. They don't, they're not invented by any human poet by any human culture, they come from millions of years of evolution and, and th th they are what makes who we really are uh, uh, deep down. So I, I think we should be very, very careful about kind of cataloging. Um, because, you know, it, it's not just, it's not just, uh, 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 why focus on artists? What about games? What about food? So, okay, so the, the English invented football, so I don't want to play football. Uh, chocolate comes from Central America. It's not a Jewish food. I wouldn't eat it. I mean, if, if I only had to eat what Jews discovered, if I only had to write, uh, to, to read uh, 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 Jewish books, my life would be very, very poor. I probably wouldn't be able to live at all because most, most food wasn't discovered or invented uh, uh, by Jewish people. So, so yes, on the one hand, when a, a government, and especially an imperialist or colonialist government, uh, uh, mobilizes artists and art as part of, of a colonial project, this should be uh, uh, seen clearly and resisted. But beyond that, I, I don't think that we should kind of cut the, 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 the human cake into these pieces and say, only this is mine, and I reject everything else. Mm -hmm. um, 
Also, I want to continue about uh, the discussion of anti-colonial war, because war in Ukraine is essentially anti-colonial. And um, do you see such, um, do you see a place for such phenomenon as colonialism in the future? And what will be the basis for such states if they will exist in the future? Um, Neil, you want to go? I, I'm... I, you go first on that one. I think as a historian, I will, I will definitely let you, let you pave the way on that. So th there are still many colonial projects uh, in, in, in par different parts of the world today. But I think we are also seeing, and, and I'll say one more thing about it, that it's, I hear voices in the West, especially from the extreme left, who say that this is an imperialist war of the United States. And I'm absolutely amazed sometimes how these people can come up with these things. You know, it's Russian bombs falling on Kiev and Kharkov, and you say it's an imperialist American war? I mean, how twisted. I mean, you, you forgot what imperialism meant originally. Originally, imperialism, you know, Roman imperialism, the legions come, take over a, a province, a city, burn it, kill the people, turn it into a province of Rome. This was the original meaning of imperialism. Then, in the 20th century, as, uh, you know, all kinds of thinkers started to elaborate on the meaning of imperialism and say this is also imperialism and this is also imperialism. And at some stage they, they forgot the original meaning of the term. What Putin is trying to do, this is the source. This is the original meaning of imperialism. And if you can't see that, so all your talk about imperialism and colonialism, you just don't understand anything. Uh, but on the other hand, yes, imperialism and colonialism can take up new forms. And one particularly dangerous form, which might be the future face of, of, of colonialism, is something that we can call data colonialism, which is based, you know, old-fashioned colonialism, well, like what the Russians are trying to do, is based on sending the soldiers in. Data colonialism is based on taking the data out. You know, you have now several corporations and governments harvesting the entire data of the world. And this could be the basis for a new kind of imperialism. You know, just imagine a situation in maybe 20 years when the entire personal data of every individual in the country, every politician, every journalist, every judge, every military officer is held by somebody in a different country. That, that, that country is no longer really independent. It's now a kind of data colony controlled for afar. If you have enough data, you don't need to send in the soldiers. Um, and also control of data means control of attention. You know, as more and more people get their news from uh, uh, these digital sources. So, you know, if, 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 if you're in a country that has to decide what, what are its views, on uh, the Russian invasion of, of, of Ukraine, and part of the population gets their uh, information, their news, from uh, all kinds of, of uh, 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 websites that flood them with disinformation, then again, you don't need to send in the soldiers in order to change the, 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 the policy of that country. You just need to control people's attention, and that's enough. Neil, do you want to answer, add something? or? There's not actually a lot that I can add to that. Um, I think, I do feel like we are entering a world in which um, there is the possibility, perhaps even the probability, that these mega corporations are going to essentially become the new companies, uh, the new countries, rather, that you, what the roles that have been held by uh, countries and governments over the last 2,000, 3,000 years, um, the the you know the monstrosity that is Facebook, the hugeness that is Amazon, um, these kind of companies, the the 
you know, Google, which started out with a policy of don't do anything evil and round about year seven quietly dropped don't do anything evil from its list of things, at least list of core precepts. They went, oh yeah, it will actually that's people can work out sometimes. Um, you know, they or their successors may well become the entities that we do wind up bowing down to that do control our lives in ways that, uh, you know, a country cannot. And we may wind up in places where we are tr simply trying to make sense of a whole new kind of world. Um, you know, and having said that, I've been fascinated for years by the, the Russian bot farms by the idea that one of the things that Russia has been enthusiastically doing for the last decade is starting uh, whose people whose job it is basically to have arguments online and not even necessarily on one side or the other. I was talking to somebody from uh, Cambridge University who was whose job was analyzing where the bot arguments were. And they, they mentioned that the some of the arguments online about trans people and uh, you got the Russian bot farms coming in enthusiastically on both sides. What they wanted to see was people arguing. What they wanted to see was people radicalizing and splitting and taking things that maybe they hadn't had real opinions on or cared about and suddenly fragmenting and going off into their separate corners um, about that and about so many other things in, in the same way that in Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift, um, you wound up with two political factions based around whether or not you opened your boiled egg from the big end or the little end and they became the political groups and they hated each other. And just the idea that you can take a tiny difference of opinion and magnify it into something that allows a wall to come tumbling down and for you to move in and take over and control the discussion. And if you're controlling the discussion, you're controlling what's going on inside people's heads. And, uh, you know, the fact that Ukraine is still out there resisting and winning uh, proves that actually this is not entirely as, as, as entirely successful a strategy as perhaps the Russians thought. Okay, we have already, um, I saw what, like, we don't have time, um, um, but I want to ans ask the last one question. It will be connected with, you mentioned both, you mentioned both uh, The End of History and uh, you know that it's famous book of Francis Fukuyama. And actually today I read his last column about Ukraine and he mentioned that um, he feels a lot of inspiration about what's going on. Uh, I will ask only one simple question. Will um, those events inspire for your future books? Will, how do you think, will it affect in your future books? Um, and, and do you have plans uh, to future books uh, from this situation we, we know? As a writer of fiction, my job, I feel right now, is to teach and inspire people and to change minds and win hearts in ways that um, are never didactic and are always pleasant. And so from that point of view, I very much feel like the entire state of the world, both positive and negative, both Ukraine, climate change, the rise of American fascism, the mess that the UK has got itself into, all of the, everything is grist to the mill. Everything is part of what I'm going to have to accept and hold on to. And, but I'm also, I know myself well enough to know that the ways that it may come out might be talking about 
a short story about you know the rocks and the stones of of Scotland 12,000 years ago from the first people to arrive there heading west from Germany and what they saw because that's how fiction works for me it's it's a process of acknowledging things accepting things and what you get out the other side is never predictable yeah i think that the the, the events kind of emphasized for me the, the importance of of teaching history and the importance of teaching uh, history in, in, in a right way, in a correct way, because of the way that the war has been justified from the very beginning and, and still now by false historical narratives. It's like somebody is coming and kind of stealing my, uh, 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 my property or, or, or my hobby or my profession and he's using it in a terrible, terrible way. And the need to reclaim it and, so, and okay, it's very, very difficult because, as I said, history is too important to be left to the historians. The politicians always try to reclaim it and twist it for their purposes. But it means that historians need to redouble their efforts to do better research, write better history, and in particular to reach as wide an audience as possible. It's not enough if we teach professional history to a limited circle of students in university, or if we uh, write articles and books that a limited circle of, of other professors or history buffs read. We need, in this sense, to also collaborate with uh, our people like Neil and learn how to tell history in a way that would reach many, many, many more people and would thereby serve as a kind of shield, as a kind of, of wall against the misappropriation of history by, uh, uh, by politicians for, 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 for criminal purposes. Um, and yeah, I, th I think that this is the, the, the main lesson that I'm taking from it in, 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 in my writing. Um, and, and I hope that other historians will also make this, this effort um, because, as I said in the beginning... <laughs> so, sorry? I hope Ukrainian historians will hear you too. <laughs> yeah, but historians all over the world... As, and as I said at, at the very beginning, the, the main purpose for me of, of writing history is not to remember the past. It's not to remember all those kings and battles and, and events centuries ago or even a few years ago. That's not important. What is important is to liberate ourselves mm -hmm. from the past, again, in the sense that understand that we always have more options. The history of a certain country, it influences it, of course, but it doesn't determine a single future. We always have more options than we think. Um, I think this is the most important lesson of history. Yeah, and we also know that future always defeats the past. So uh, we know exactly who will win, win this war. Thank you for this incredible uh, conversation. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm really proud that um, you will be the guest during this um, VIV International Book Fest Festival. It's important for all uh, Ukrainians, and I think not only Ukrainians, for all free people and for people who love uh, who loves books, who loves uh, reading, and um, thank you, thank you so much for for your time. Thank you very thank much. You.